Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marion Fourcad. I'm the director of Social Science Matrix, and I am pleased to welcome you to today's panel, a panel very dear to my heart, uh, Pandemic Lessons Assessing Educational Inequalities in the Wake of COVID-19. Now, for those of you who are new to Matrix, we are a cross-disciplinary social science research institute at UC Berkeley. Today's event is part of our Matrix on Point series, a series devoted to panel discussions on important matters of the moment. So we will I will just announce a few upcoming events. We will have two more Matrix on Point events this semester. In April, we will host a panel called Truth and Denial, Searching for Information in the Digital Era. And in May, uh, we will present a discussion on the American pursuit of racial justice with scholars from UC Berkeley and uh, beyond. To quickly highlight a few other upcoming events, um, registration is still open for an event we have tomorrow, actually, an author meets critics panel featuring uh, Jovan Scott Lewis, uh, Scammers Yard, the crime of black repair in Jamaica. And on March 19, we have a lecture by Evgeny Morozov, the author of uh, you know, the famous book, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. And he will talk about his forthcoming book. So please check our website for further details on these and, and, and other upcoming events. And be sure to subscribe to our, to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter. And now um, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of today's panel, who in turn will introduce our panelists. Uh, Zeus Leonardo. I don't know if we can see Zeus. Hello, welcome Zeus. Uh, is Professor and Associate Dean of Education and Faculty in the Critical Theory uh, designated emphasis at UC Berkeley. Uh, Professor Leonardo has published numerous essays on critical social thought in education, and his current research interests involve the study of ideologies and discourses in education with respect to structural relations and power. His most recent books are Edward Said and Education, Race, Whiteness and, educa and Education, Race Frameworks, and education and racism. And he is the editor of the Handbook of Cultural Politics and Education. He is a past vice president and fellow of the American Educational Research Association. Now, without further ado, I turn over to Professor Leonardo for an opening statement and for the panelists' introductions. Thank you, Zeus. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Falcon. Um, so today uh, I'll be moderating the panel on lessons from the pandemic and educational inequalities. Uh, this is, has been important for us in many ways and education is included in that. Um, the order for today's panel will first be Prudence L. Carter, who is the E.H. and Mary E. Pardee Professor and Dean of the Graduate School of Education at UC Berkeley. Dean Carter's research focuses on factors that both shape and reduce economic, social, and cultural inequalities among social groups in schools and society. Dean Carter's award-winning book called Keeping It Real, School Success Beyond Black and White, interrogates cultural explanations used to explain achievement and racial identity, uh, excuse me, and racial identity for low-income Black and Latino youth in the US. Her research has also been featured in the Peabody Award-winning documentary and on dozens of NPR or national public radio shows. After Professor Carter is Emily Ozer, who is a clinical and community psychologist and professor at UC Berkeley's School of Public Health, whose research focuses on the role of school climate in adolescent development and mental health, school-based interventions, and participatory action research in which youth are trained to generate research evidence based to address problems they want to improve in their schools and communities. She's the co-founder and co-director of Innovations for Youth or I4Y, and she is actively working in a research practice partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District to integrate student-led research in equity and school improvement initiatives. She, is also, she also leads a six district study on the use of evidence from youth participatory action research in K through 12 school systems. She will be joined 
by her research partners in the Q&A session. Finally, Matt Ruffalo, Matthew Ruffalo is a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, who is a social scientist at Google. His book, Digital Divisions, How Schools Create Inequality in the Tech Era, was recently published with University of Chicago Press. He is also author, co-author of Affinity Online, How Connection and Shared Interests Fuel Learning. His work has appeared in journals such as American Journal of Sociology, Symbolic Interaction, and Social Currents. Our panelists will have roughly 15 to 17 minutes to present, and then at roughly around um, 1140, we will open up the discussion to the Q&A session. So without further ado, let, me, let us begin with Dean Carter's presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for that introduction, um, Professor Leonardo, and thank you, Marielle and Foucault, for inviting me and the Matrix for inviting me. The, um, the, the topic for the discussion today is one that I have spoken a great deal about in the past year. Um, from the beginning, when many of us were throwing our hands up and not really understanding what to do and there was lots of discourse and debate about pandemic pods and the exacerbation of educational and economic and social inequality because of the access of these particular pods for private tutors and uh, teachers would be hired by more middle-class and affluent parents um, to facilitate and supplement their children's learning in the, in the uh, wake of the shutdown of schools. And then none of us actually anticipated that as of March of 2020, that we would be at home in remote learning for at least a year, the overwhelming majority of us, where roughly 60% of public school students in the US were uh, subject to some form of remote or hybrid learning where there could be, uh, well, actually mostly remote um, with a greater percentage in both remote and hybrid learning. And the question that has emerged over this year as we think about this fundamental and foundational social institution education is what is the impact? What is the long-term consequence of a pandemic on the educational and now social and emotional well-being of American school children? And it's a really vexing question because it's a question that we're asking in the midst of what is unprecedented for many of us in our lives. There are very few who are left who are around for the 1918 um, flu pandemic. And how do you approach it, particularly when it comes to the impact on schooling? But it is also a vexing question for many of us because for the first time, it's also assaulting our ideals and notions of this great superstructure around what education means and what its functions are. And Dara, I would argue that since the 1980s, when we had increasing anxiety about the competitive nature of US schooling in this country and stronger accountability um, measures started to be implemented, proposed and implemented, that now many of us are anxious about the so-called learning law and the widening achievement disparities, what many have commonly come to refer to as achievement gaps. And so I wanna just talk about, I want to do three things today in this uh, short time that I have, is one, to talk about where we were in terms of thinking about children's learning as it was disaggregated by social classes, by race, by ethnicity, by income, to think about where we are and even beg the question philosophically of whether or not it makes sense to be asking the same questions pre of, the, of our children pre-pandemic during a pandemic, and then where do we go from here? And so I'm going to share my screen um, as I wanna make a few comments about begging the question about whether or not this is the moment to actually reimagine what we do in schools after this, cessation of the global pandemic. And so let me just share a few thoughts. It is the case that it is so common as a tacit understanding about so-called achievement gaps. I mean, they are there, they are test score gaps and they are highly correlated 
with socioeconomic standing in this country, which is then also highly correlated with racial and ethnic uh, minority status in the US. And so this is drawing on the work of the sociologist of education and his colleagues down at Stanford University, Sean Reardon, that shows across the largest hundred public school districts in the country, we see a, a widespread, but we also see a pattern. To the left of the, at the bottom axis, of, um, you see to the left, or uh, this is actually showing the districts that are the poorest and the most economically disadvantaged in the US, and to the right of those that are more affluent. This middle line across here shows what the average test scores, and he looked, his team looked at test scores across 40 years in all school districts in this country. So this is arguably the largest school, uh, school data uh, test score data set in, um, in US history, actually. And, there was, and what they really found is just a high correlation between the median income uh, and, uh, based on a composite measure of wealthy districts in this country, middle class to upper middle class districts, and those that were poor. In fact, there were no districts whose median income was below uh, the national average that were mostly poor and dis uh, disadvantaged where the kids were actually scoring above the national median. And this was from 2009 to 2016. It's mainly on average that kids were scoring mostly in the more upper income districts where they were at the average or higher. There is spread, so this was not overly deterministic about where one's um, poverty status or wealth status is. You'll see variation even within those classes. But I show this just, just to show that we already had test score uh, differences, which many people are consumed by because it is arguably that education has become more of a, a consumable uh, good, a consumer, a private good in the society. And many of us are making conscious decisions at the individual level in our families about where we uh, go to school, where we buy homes, where we live, because we have bought and subscribed to an ideology that that matters to what our, our children's overall ec educational and academic welfare will look like. So the tests show that. If we predicate the quality of schools on test score outcomes, they show that class matters and certainly neighborhood and school um, status in terms of income matter to the test. The McKinsey report, uh, uh, McKinsey and company came out with a report just in December of 2020 showing us where students are today in this pandemic based on data that they've gathered, uh, gathered over the 1920 year predicated on the uh, academic year of 1920, just prior to the pandemic. And this is looking at the percentage of average year learning where 100% is equivalent to uh, historical match scores over previous three years. And they broke this down from uh, kindergarten to fifth grade, looking at reading, math, and then math across grades. The black dots will represent the schools with 50% of uh, so where the more 50% or more of the students are of color. The um, dotted vertical line shows where the average learning should have been uh, at that grade level um, um, with that particular subject matter. And then the blue shows where kids who are, are in schools were more than 50% of the kids are white. This is also highly correlated with class, no doubt, but it's, it shows very similarly to the, the reared in all data that there is um, some learning um, disparities in terms of what we, what we numericize and what we understand to matter um, in the conventional sense for students. And so it is the case as you go down through the grades that by now looking at that most students have fallen behind um, but students of color are continually to, uh, faring worse. So the bottom line is that the pandemic has exacerbated the inequalities that we saw just coming into the pandemic um, and that there has been um, and, and that there is um, continues to be. But it's not surprising. Um, inequality was there prior to the pandemic. And as we think about the things that have to have the other tools that are required to be responsive to the impact on schooling with the pandemic, access to digital, uh, to broadband access, to digital technology, to the highest teaching quality, right? There are many large districts that were just completely assaulted by the pandemic. And um, more specifically, there are lots of children in homes where the resources were just not available. While many large public districts were able to eventually get Chromebooks to their kids, 
I mean, there were the issues around the, the cultural capital or the cultural know-how or the technological know-how of how to actually be there for your children, um, to, to sign on. What happens when there's when the computer goes off? And I know this personally, I'm doing this simultaneously every day as I'm working, my, my child coming up and saying, a seven-year-old, oh, I just got knocked off. And I have the, the, the largest package that my uh, actual internet company offers and still have trouble. So imagine the families where they're, they're, they're low, lesser means. There are fewer people in the household who actually understand how to get on and off, how to manipulate Zoom, how to even manipulate the asynchronous learning because many districts went to relying on digital curricula when their kids were not in front of the screen with the teacher. And then even that time was limited. So all of these factors have gone into the calculus of what shaped the, uh, the learning outcomes of our children. And then there's also the difference between the public and private schools. Many private schools though are, are very much um, running on their own budgets and had to stay open and had to do things in this country. And the private schools are highly uh, correlated with race and class in our society. And those schools, many of them maintain more of an in-person um, a curriculum and teaching a schedule because they had to. Um, they would have lost students, they would have lost business, many of them would have had to shut down. And so this is another slide from the McKinsey report that shows just even by race, on average 60% of kids were remote learning on the past year, about 20% were hybrid, which was being in that meaning going to school part time in person and then at home some and then about 19% were fully in person. Well, we also see that there is a significant racial divide here, just based on the data, a 20 percentage difference between black and white students in remote learning. Um, and the same is roughly the case in terms of remote learning for uh, is even uh, greater for Latinx and white students in the country. Only about 14% of black and Latinx students were in person compared to 25% of whites. And then you'll see that, um, but the majority with the exception of whites, um, roughly 50% of white students were remote, but the majority were non-remote and um, or hybrid. And the overwhelming majority of black and Latinx students um, were remote. So, Given that, it's not surprising that we're going to see some, some disparities in, 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 in performance in terms of the testing and the assessment, um, in terms of learning acquisition. I prefer to use learning acquisition. I don't think, I, philosophically for me, it's not fair to be talking about in a deficit way about children who've been exposed to a pandemic. Um, I'm, I don't hear us talking about us as adults who are professionals working. Our productivity for many of us um, has been, um, slowed down, but we know why. And the same has happened for children in terms of the knowledge acquisition. And the, so the question is, well, where do we go from here? Now, here's the really interesting pattern is that in July, 2020, when we were in the thick of this pandemic, there were so many more people uh, based on Pew Research Center data who uh, were worried about health concerns. It is the case as we've been in this longer, my one year anniversary actually is today, um, that increasingly academic concerns are now seen as more pressing. And if you turned on the news this morning or the last week, you have seen more and more and more angst emerging around what's going to happen to our children. So districts are rushing, the Biden administration, Harris administration is trying to incentivize, motivate and support. Um, Governor Newsom and the legislatures have had to try to incentivize districts to open by uh, April 1st, particularly for pre-K pre through two. And for those of us who are in the Berkeley public schools, many of us received a letter last night from the superintendent. They're on it trying to, uh, um, um, trying to respond to the demand, to the parental anxiety about what the massive impact could be on our children. And so the U.S. is showing that just not more than less than a year ago, we were more concerned about health concerns. As of today, Feb as of February 21st, there was a higher concern about our students falling behind academically without in-person um, instruction. But here's what's really fascinating to me for, as a sociologist. The views of whether schools should wait to reopen until teachers are vaccinated are really, really highly correspondent and, and correlated to, to social background. 
59% of all Americans believe that we should wait until all of our educators are vaccinated, whereas 40% want to reopen as soon as possible, according to Pew Research data. We see that, that when you disaggregate that by race, though, it becomes very variable and a divergent. Among whites, it's roughly split, um, with the slight majority wanting to wait. Um, for Blacks, it's not roughly split. For African Americans in this country, 80%, four out of five, would prefer to wait until teachers are um, vaccinated. For Latinx folks, it's two out of three plus. Um, for Asian Americans, it's almost three quarters. So we have a, a we have a, soci a social divide in terms of race around how people are even understanding it. And perhaps that could be attributable to what the impact of the virus has been, and, um, and it has been disproportionate. While the pandemic is in some ways um, an equal opportunist, anyone could get sick from it. I'm sorry, the virus itself. The pandemic and how it has played out and manifested has not been that. And we know from the data from the CDC that black and brown households have been the most radically and adversely impacted by this, uh, by this, um, by this virus. So it, um, these children in these households may be more heavily impacted and there may be more fear and certainly concern. There's also the economic vulnerability that has happened. We see also from this slide, the local, um, the income divide. It's mostly affluent people who, um, particularly middle and upper middle class are pushing for the opening of schools without full uh, vaccination more than lower income parents. And then there is an ideological divide. So um, just one more slide and, then, and, and I'm going to um, finish. So I have a few ideas, I have a few thoughts about this right now. I've said the first three, but I'm thinking about where do we go from here as we close um, and start to go back from schools. I believe that it's this moment is begging us to actually have some stronger considerations for how we organize students. It is the case I suspect that we'll see in the data as we collect more, that we're gonna see kids having gained knowledge and acquisition and, and have strengths in certain areas and not strengths in others. And it's not gonna necessarily be fully uh, coordinated by grade or age. Um, it's actually going to have a lot to do with social background, but it have, may have something to do with other things. Some of the data is suggesting that kids who have historically not done as well in person are actually doing better online. It will beg the question of whether or not we actually are in a moment where we're going to have hybrid learning and we'll have to be going back and forth from home to the classroom, not just because of viruses, but because of climate change issues. And what are the implications for how we prepare for that in the long term? And more specifically, how we equip and adapt our educators for becoming better communicators, better pedagogues online as well as in the classroom. And then third, the, some of the data are showing that we may need to be thinking about more individualized uh, uh, attention and small group learning and national, the proposal for national tutoring programs. Some studies are showing very highly effective influences of tutoring for those kids who have fallen behind, if we use that, the who fallen or who have not gained as much knowledge. And this is now a moment to start thinking about building an infrastructure to support and scaffold students. So with that said, I'm just raising a few issues. I, I'm going to just end on a, a, a quote that re means a lot to me because I think she's right. Um, the uh, Indian uh, poet, essayist, uh, incredible thinker, Arundhati Roy has, has begged us to consider this. She says, and I quote, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. I'm wondering if we're ready to imagine a new way of doing schooling based on some of the lessons we're learning from this pandemic. It is not a one size fit all, it cannot be standardized. And dare I say, we might want to be careful with what we're numericizing because the issue is much more complex than that. I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Dean Carter, thank you. Um, to the audience, please jot your notes. Uh, there's a lot of information coming at us uh, for the Q&A that follows. So let me pivot now to uh, Professor Ozer. 
and uh, her team, uh, her research team's findings. Take it away, Professor Ozer. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay, well, um, thank you, Dean Carter. That was just such a profound um, and important framing and it's a really great jumping off point uh, for the focus of my remarks today, which, um, which will emphasize the role of students themselves in really um, helping us to focus on what are the most important questions right now in this historical moment and what are some of the opportunities to really rethink, reimagine what schools can look like. So um, here on my first slide, um, I want to acknowledge uh, the key partners in this work, uh, San Francisco Unified uh, Research Planning and Accountability Office, especially Dr. Norma Ming and Devin Corrigan. I'm really glad that Dr. Norma Ming, who's supervisor of research, is here to join us in the Q&A period. Um, San Francisco Peer Resources um, uh, uh, staff, ED, and students. Um, and uh, from UC Berkeley, my uh, co-principal investigator on the project I'll be talking about today, Dr. Susan Stone, uh, professor and associate dean in the School of Social Welfare will also be here to share in the Q&A. Um, and also just want to acknowledge my important research team and colleagues here. So, um, so I'm gonna introduce um, and, and really frame the issue, the role, the potential role of research practice partnerships or RPPs for short, as well as participatory research as, um, as really potentially critical in this moment to both assess and address educational inequalities. I'm gonna give an overview of a 15 year partnership with San Francisco Peer Resources and a flavor for some of the ways that students themselves have been um, identifying, studying, and proposing solutions for, um, for lived inequalities in their schools and communities. And then uh, discuss how um, our, our new, a new partnership with San Francisco Unified, how we're working to integrate youth-generated evidence um, into, um, into the routines, into the continuous improvement and equity work of the district. So as um, Dean Carter already eloquently described what's been going on, um, and many of us um, have been living in different forms, uh, the ways in which this pandemic has made visible and also exacerbated existing inequities. And, um, and I, I, to your point, I think learning, we really should question that term of learning loss, but just the ways that, um, not only what's happening academically, but also the, 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 the ways in which um, many communities have relied on K-12 education for food, for breakfast, for lunch, um, technology, um, you know, access to resources. So those have been very major emphases of our um, partnering school districts, just trying to um, make food and technology available for students. Um, also re-envision the role of parent connection as um, hopefully Norma Ming can speak to a little bit in, in the Q&A. Um, you know, but making, I think there was already a knowledge, but just really raising um, awareness of, how, of the ways that many students do not have quiet, safe, stable spaces um, to engage in online education. We've, we've been hearing a lot more about mental health recently. I think one of the things that our partners in SFUSD have, have identified for us is also just the loss of those in-person wellness spaces, those physical spaces in the school where students could go to decompress, where students, particularly those with LGBTQ plus identities could find a safe and affirming uh, space for identity. So the ways in which those physical spaces engage, were able to engage students in, in ways that weren't possible or very, or, or students really have struggled with engaging online. So, and, and this really has, um, has, has really sort of blown open or, or kind of disrupted. What, what do we mean by school engagement? And um, as my colleagues have spoken to, uh, or will speak to, the, the ways in which that was defined 
previously in terms of attendance or um, what, what does it really mean to be engaged in school and how do we open that up? What does it mean in an online context, but what does that mean moving forward as we, as we hopefully come back um, to physical spaces? What are the other critical equity issues that need attention? Um, and I think um, as, as Dean Carter said, how do we really reimagine schools as we come back about how can they be more equitable and, and make a break um, with the past? And, and why, what I'm really here to argue and, and to sort of demonstrate is the potential role of youth-led participatory action research and other forms of student voice in informing uh, that vision, the assessment and action. So I think many of us have been familiar with some of the impressive um, uh, examples of youth-led organizing in the past years. I'm showing here on screen a couple of images, one of a, um, a peaceful racial, racial justice protest in San Francisco in the past year organized by a, an SFUSD student, um, the gun control March for Our Lives protests around the country. So I think we've been familiar with um, the power of young people um, for potentially making change. But what many people are less familiar with is that sort of behind the scenes, there's been a growing movement for young people as, as researchers, as um, scholars, as people who are generating evidence that, that has very important insights, not only for school districts, but for other systems that um, are supposed to serve youth. So youth-led participatory action research or YPAR is uh, this iterative um, cycle of research and action that has a social justice and equity focus in which youth um, are making decisions, have power with, with guidance and support from adults. Uh, the goal is to improve their schools and communities. And, and really critically, uh, young people are choosing the issue that they wanna work on. This is something that matters to them and they get trained um, in, in, in a range of different uh, research practices to generate data and make recommendations for action. So a core um, principle of participatory action research generally is that it's a, an approach of working with rather than, than on those affected, most affected by the problem under study. There's shared power over processes, the cyclical integration of research and action. And I think really importantly, there's a, a at its core, it's really a radical revisioning of who has expertise, who's able to generate evidence and what counts as knowledge, that it, it doesn't just reside among us with um, letters after our name or coming from the academy, but that there's really, or adults, but that there's really important um, expertise that we need to bring to the table to solve the most pressing equity problems and other problems of our society. So why might it matter here for this conversation about K-12 education? Well, in our work, as I'll show you, um, and in much of the work that's happening around the country, we see that students frame the questions, the research questions, based on their insider expertise, which is particularly critical when we're talking about sensitive or stigmatized issues that we adults, um, even those adults who um, work closely with young people, may not be aware of, or may, as um, Dean Carter alluded to, may be framing from a deficit perspective um, and not really um, understanding uh, the full um, range of the phenomena or experience. Um, this can also be a really important way to critique, for young people to critique the existing forms of data to potentially enhance the validity of those. And we've seen that in our own work. Uh, another important um, opportunity is for YPART to provide diverse forms of qualitative and quantitative data to really illuminate um, what might be going on dynamically and to supplement the administrative data that's often um, used in K-12 education. YPAR can also inform very um, uh, much more quick response, time sensitive, iterative local solutions to what might be going on um, in a school. So, so when the young people present back their findings, there are opportunities for potentially immediate changes in practices and then sort of short and long-term changes in, in policy. And I have an example here, there's a, a program called PLUS that's in um, 
at, at least 100 schools across California, where the young people, the peer educators, take a, a, a monthly survey of their peers. And based on the data that they're getting from their peers, they're able to target their peer education efforts towards anti-bullying and peer belonging and equity issues. So they're getting kind of more real-time kinds of assessments than what we typically see in, uh, you know, if this were happening at the state level or happening, you know, for peer-reviewed research. And then there's a large literature that I'm happy to share or, or share more about later about the developmental impact for students who engage in this kind of work, what it means for young people to, to be experts, to be seen as experts, to develop these skills and to have that sense of purpose and contribution that we know is developmentally important for adolescents. So for example, here in San Francisco Unified, at Lowell High School, there's been more than 15 years of YPART uh, research by students and action on their school culture and to diversify their admissions. For those of you who've been reading about Lowell High School in the news, I, I have yet to see the way that this research from the young people has been uh, in that dialogue. And so I think there are a lot of important opportunities, not only to, um, to for this uh, research to happen, but to think about how is this research used? How does it get to the decision makers? How does it get out into the public discourse? Here's an, a recent example of some students um, in the last couple of years at Lowell who were successful in changing the public transit routes through their research because what they found, they this was an equity issue as they saw it because students coming from the Southeast sectors of the city, such as the Bayview neighborhood, had, to, had all these delays in getting to school. So we're, we're, we're being marked tardy, we're, we're not having equal access to, the, to education, and this was also deterring students from some neighborhoods to uh, apply to Lowell. So here's a very concrete example, and, and also a, a concrete example of how they were able to make a change um, based on their research. I wanna share with you a couple of, of examples. I'm gonna go pretty quickly through here, but these are from Balboa, um, San Francisco, Balboa peer resources classes. And so every year, every semester, students pick a focal group. Um, they, at the school, they, they engage in a, in a research cycle and then they make recommendations for change. So here the, the, the students were focusing on ninth and 10th grade Latinx students. They noted disproportionate referrals um, at the school. They went through um, a, a whole research cycle and these are their how might we questions and you know, sort of guiding their research. They came up with some concrete solutions based on what they learned about what could be implemented at the school. Um, and you know, that, that included a range of different solutions, including um, uh, staffing and job hiring, and then laid out next steps about what they would do. So as I, as I alluded to earlier, there've been more than 150 of these projects just in San Francisco Unified over the past decade, but this is happening all over the country. Here's another example from Balboa um, that was focusing on students with individualized education plans or IEPs. And so through their qualitative research, they learned about what students were feeling about not feeling respected in the community. Um, they came up with very concrete solutions um, about what helps, what worked for them. So these, this was all happening before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, the students shifted to focusing on what online learning was like and to give rapid feedback to their teachers about what was working and what wasn't working. So we won't have time to go through all of this, but here's some very concrete pieces of feedback based on about 40 students at the school. Unlike here at the university level, High school students don't, or any K-12 students don't typically um, give teacher evaluations. So teachers don't get that kind of feedback about practices. So here are some of the other concrete solutions. These were, I'm, I'm just showing sort of a brief sample of what they presented back to the teachers. And then teachers had an opportunity to respond and, and did. There were changes in practices that some teachers were able to take up and make. And what you see here um, to, to Dean Carter's point is about all of the different challenges for students related to what was going on in their home um, and you know, students taking jobs, students with, with young children. So there are a range of different um, circumstances that young people and families have been dealing with. As well, they were able to give positive feedback to, to, tell, to tell teachers what was working. So I wanna just take a step back. So this is work that, um, you know, I've 
kind of focused on the role of, of, of participatory research, um, how that can contribute now. So um, one of the things, I, I, what, I think another really key question for us at this historical moment is what is our role um, at the university? What is our role as academics, as researchers in, in partnership with school districts and other agencies to be addressing these inequalities. And so I wanna talk briefly about a new partnership with San Francisco Unified that we've developed over the past several years that built on longstanding investigator relationships and partnerships between Berkeley faculty and um, different parts of San Francisco Unified. This, was, uh, this work was actually nurtured by a social science matrix group that helped us to organize ourselves and to get internal funding from the Berkeley Vice Chancellor for Research Office um, and then key commitments from other units on campus when we went for an external grant to the WT Grant Foundation that's now providing more stable funding for the next several years for this partnership. And what we heard from San Francisco Unified was that they were aware of this YPAR work, this student voice work that had been going on for, for more than a decade, but it hadn't been integrated or connected with the work of the district. And so the research, this, the, the research office, re, the RPA office said, we want to partner with you, Berkeley, and, and uh, our team to figure out how to really bring that into uh, their work more centrally and to be hearing that, that evidence. So um, this was a, our partnership is cross-disciplinary at Berkeley. Our, our an, um, initial focus based on, on district priorities was on reducing inequalities in chronic absenteeism, which of course means something very different um, in the pandemic. Um, and to transform research utilization and improvement right, routines by incorporating YPAR. Here are some of the key stakeholders, some of whom are on the call today. And as you can see, we have a, a, a steering committee at Berkeley that cuts across different units at Berkeley. Here's our steering committee. Um, so we see faculty in psychology and public health and social welfare and education. Um, and, you know, this having this interdisciplinarity has been is critical because these are not issues that just reside within education. What students are dealing with has to do clearly has to do with public health, with housing, with all kinds of other factors going on in the community. So we need people working together who understand and are coming from different disciplines. And this is really part of a broader Berkeley vision that we have because not only is there an, an RPP with San Francisco, there's one with Oakland that Dean Carter has been instrumental in, um, in leading and, and co-leading. And, and there are many partnerships that exist at Berkeley, but we often don't know what's out there or, or how we're connecting with different community groups or districts. And so what we're, what we're working on now with some with support from this grant from, from WT Grant is to really try to make more visible these partnerships to support them and also to strengthen the ways that um, as faculty doing this kind of um, time intensive community engaged scholarship that that can be recognized on campus um, and, and through our um, our tenure and promotion system uh, more, more strongly. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Zeus. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Ozer. Thank you for reminding us the importance of uh, community-engaged research, particularly YPAR and um, student and youth knowledge. Um, <clears throat> our last panelist is up next, and that is uh, Dr. Matthew Ruffalo. Take us home. Thank you so much. Uh, super excited to be here. And I feel like even as a panelist, I've learned so much already from the other uh, amazing speakers here. Um, and like them, I did a bit of an exercise myself on the kind of before, during and after pandemic as a way to process my thoughts on this. And, you know, I just uh, finished a book on digital inequalities in middle school. Um, and even though that happened pre-pandemic, I do think it gave me some clues to kind of think about in terms of how educational inequalities are playing out, um, but hopefully uh, where I will shed some light maybe and encourage some really fun discussion is uh, really digging in on the digital front um, as well. So um, essentially, I hope to convince you that there are two intersecting lenses that are really important to understanding digital inequality in education in these crazy times. 
The first is to root our thinking in what scholars of digital inequality refer to as the three levels of the digital divide. And I'll uh, come back to what each of these are. But the second, um, and I believe that these levels are intimately intertwined with this, is the persistence of race and class inequality, as well as other statuses like gender, disability, and more, in shaping unequal resourcing and unequal student treatment. And so these are very closely uh, related to the to levels of digital divide, as I hope to argue. But you know, that's kind of like the end of my story, my kind of like key argument kind of ruined it up front. And I'm gonna kind of go back a bit to share a bit of a narrative about education technology over the last couple decades, leading up to a little bit of my work, just to kind of convey what I mean by all of this. So well before the pandemic, before mass inflicted remote schooling, techno utopianism really ruled the educational landscape. And I know educators in their room are probably like rolling their eyes a little bit at some of this stuff. And I agree, like in the, in the 2000s, when all of this digital tech stuff really took off, you couldn't miss the sheer volume of idealism about the power of technology. Phrases like technology will change the classroom, technology will bring us to the future of learning. And my favorite slash least favorite, uh, that technology is the great equalizer. Any sociologist would kind of roll their eyes or really um, any, anyone with a, a bit of a critical uh, mind to all of this. But when I really started thinking about this work, this was the predominant reign of thought. And a big part of this, of course, is this narrative of that you know, achieving the holy grail of digital access, you know, one laptop per child, one-to-one -one iPad programs, Chromebook rollouts, et cetera, that all of this was part of a frame of thinking that if you just get those devices in people's hands and in teachers' hands, that learning will somehow magically happen. Um, and I think one interesting piece of this puzzle too, and this is something that's been the bulk of the focus of my work, was that at the same time as there was this utopian idea of technology saving schooling, young people were actually truly leading early digital adoption rates. Um, you know, I really watched along with the rest of the world as young people uh, adopted everything from internet connected smartphones, laptops, iPads, and video games to connect with one another. And what was interesting about this too is that it seemed to be occurring regardless of social origin, to be able to just have access to basic technologies and particularly for young people to play around with friends online. And in a landmark book by Mimi Ito and her colleagues, they provided the most comprehensive documentation of what all those statistics meant, um, really documenting what young people were doing with these digital tools. And what they found, I think, changed a lot of the discussion in the learning sciences and really bolstered, I think, much of what we now talk about, you know, digital literacies is kind of a phrase that uh, gets thrown around. But, you know, they really found that young people were using digital tools to hang out, mess around and geek out, you know, kind of like emic anthropological genres of participation. But really what they found was that by playing around with friends online, they had to learn how to use these digital tools to be able to play with friends online. And so they were finding that young people were actually developing facility with hardware and software, online communication and digital media production to play with friends. But as a sociologist with eyes towards understanding educational inequality, it made me wonder, you know, even if kids were developing some basic digital skills from playing with friends, and even if we assume that some access to digital technologies is leveling in some ways, would that actually help them in school? Like would, would you know, would that help them get ahead? Well, in 2015, as I was sorting through all of this, I read about this news story featuring a 14 year old at a school in Texas who was actually quite good at digital technologies in ways that many of these idealist views of tech described. Um, his name was Ahmed and he himself was a digital tinkerer and he had used available technology at home to quite literally build a digital clock. 
this I think is not too far afield from fabled stories of like Steve Jobs tinkering around in his garage and becoming a respected innovator. But something happened that was quite different than what happened to people like Steve Jobs. When Ahmed brought his homemade clock to school to show his teachers, they called the police. They had him arrested, handcuffed, escorted off campus. Innovative wasn't even remotely top of mind for his teachers and administrators, who instead quite literally believed that he made a homemade bomb and brought it to school. I just kept thinking over and over, why wasn't Ahmed seen as an innovator instead of quite literally a terrorist by people that are running his school? How does race and how do other statuses factor in here in ways that shape how children are treated and young adults are treated in their uses of digital technology? And so hopefully these kind of two intersecting lenses I talked about are starting to feel a little bit clearer and how I've thought through the recent history of digital tech in education. On the one hand, there are these three levels of the digital divide. You know, we can think about inequities in access to devices and to broadband internet. Um, we can also think about inequities in who has the skills to use these different things, to participate in school, to participate in society. But the third, something I don't think is studied enough that I've really tried to chew on is how are students treated unequally with similar devices and similar uses of technology even? And this of course leads me to the second lens. We need to think about the ways that racism, classism, sexism, and more intersect each of these divides and how they shaped schooling before the pandemic as well as during and after. And so in thinking about pre-pandemic, we know that of course schools are differently resourced and that digital access divides definitely do exist and not just the availability of technology at school, but its quality and the maintenance of that technology. Um, and on top of that, teachers at less resource schools are even less likely than normal to get technology training. Um, they certainly didn't, haven't been getting it at least kind of before the pandemic in teacher training programs and are likely not to receive it in the field as teachers, even if their students know some of the basics of how to use it. Um, there's uh, teachers are a bit behind uh, overall, I think, in terms of getting this training. But a good thing, like one of the glimmers here, I think, is that school level divides have indeed shrunk um, uh, largely in the 90s and in the early 2000s nationwide. But critically, these divides are usually measured in terms of schools' basic access to internet and devices like computers, which is a very different story than fully remote learning, which I'll get to uh, in a second. But as I said in my work, I focus on that third divide, unequal treatment with digital tools. And what I do is try to show that teachers treat similar forms of digital expression and digital skill expression that young people share at school. Teachers treat that differently depending on the race and class of their student body. And in ways that I think are very similar to how scholars studied pre-digital race and class structures, like of, of course work by Prudence, um, uh, by Angela Valenzuela, by Paul Willis, and many others. And what I find is that the predominantly white middle-class teachers that I studied saw minoritized students' digital skills and digital expression through a lens of race and class stereotypes. And as a result, they dismissed the value of digital skills that less affluent students of color displayed while at the same time validating these very same digital practices that white students did. Instead of their social media use being innovative and rel relevant to learning um, for less affluent students of color, it was seen as detention worthy. This is quite contradictory to our thinking about notions of unequal childhoods, for example, which argue that if only every child had needed skills to succeed in school, that they would actually succeed. Instead, what I find is that school context determines if kid, kids' digital skills even count. Even if kids from different race and class backgrounds have those digital skills, schools unequally reward them. 
All right. So that was kind of pre-pandemic thinking where I was steeped in for a while. But what about now? What about during? Well, first of all, we need to kind of clear this up that, you know, for those of us who study online learning, this is not the time to really deliver on it well. There's a lot going on that teachers have to deal with that are making it far from ideal time to deliver on this. And importantly, another distinction is that in reviewing this crazy year, we have to recognize that remote schooling is not the same set of questions that we've sorted through in the recent past about digital devices at school. This is right now not just a matter of whether you're going to use cell phones in class for learning or if you can get Chromebooks or laptops for people. Now you need these devices to attend school. And so to that end, the first level of the digital divide is certainly exacerbated. And so, you know, we know that 15% of U.S. households with children lack high-speed internet. We know that one in three low-income families lack internet. I mean, I think a lot of the faculty in the room, myself even included, I've heard stories from students telling me that their parents had to drive them to a fast food parking lot just to access their Wi-Fi so that students wouldn't ding them for not being in class or participating in the way that they expect it. So the digital access divide is certainly exacerbated. Another thing too, is that that second log of level of the divide, digital skills are also incredibly important. And I really think that teachers have been suffering in particular on this front. There's next to no training for teachers on how to use technology, either while in school or while in the field. Teachers had to figure out how to do fully online remote schooling on a dime in April. And then again, when many schools said that we would be going back to school despite evidence from science saying that we shouldn't go back to school, had to then redo all of their curriculum to go online. I mean, it's a nightmare. Um, all the while, teachers and students and their families are worried about their health um, and questions about the pandemic. And so despite those first two levels of the divide, access and skills being exacerbated here, I also believe that we are witness to what I studied pre-pandemic, which is unequal treatment and unequal reward for students' digital participation. So for example, there have been schools that are enforcing dress codes during remote schooling as if like all of us aren't wearing pajamas waist down right now. I mean, let's be real. Um, there are also schools that are employing eye tracking software as an effort to make sure that students aren't cheating while they're working remotely. And I would bet you top dollar that the schools that are employing these tactics are not primarily serving wealthy and white children. Um, but since especially I'm not collecting data right now, you know, I know that there are a lot of a uh, number, uh, number of other scholars that are doing this very important cutting edge work. I recently attended a series of talks at the Sociology of Education Association and got a glimmer of Kamira Pujo's uh, work right now. She's an incoming professor at Bard College and I got her permission, permission to share an anecdote from her work. She's observing how despite similar access to tools, even for remote learning, more affluent schools are using them in ways that provide a very different learning experience um, than at the schools she studied, serving uh, less affluent women of color uh, who are attending, um, uh, attending schools. And instead of using software like Google Classroom, um, synchronous instruction with Zoom and extracurriculars, the students she interviewed are basically being given worksheets to be done asynchronously. Schools become like a transactional affair, um, especially given the fact that um, in particular, the young black women that she interviewed are developing digital skills by participating in racial justice movements happening despite all of this remote learning going on. And so their digital skills are going on use, unused and unvalidated at school. And so hopefully that's a good start just at thinking through some of these digital aspects of education during these crazy times. And I really look forward to uh, a fun discussion about this. So I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruffalo. Well, folks, we have a, a whopping uh, 25 minutes or so now for a Q&A. And so um, I uh, encourage folks to put their questions in the Q&A and we already have some. I have 
one or two myself, but I will forego that and, and uh, if we have time at the end. Um, this uh, may be for Professor Ozer, but anybody in the room can, in, can uh, attempt to answer this. But uh, the question from Gilberto, uh, Gilberto Cooper is, how might a school district initiate a formal partnership between researchers or academics and the community to address this historical achievement gap of students of color? For example, how to improve math pedagogy. How might this involve parents and guardians in the partnership? And how could the terms of the, these partnerships be mutually articulated by the people and in groups involved? Thanks, I was hoping that um, Dr. Norma Ming and Dr. Susan Stone might be able to turn on their cameras and join us because that seemed like a perfect question to forward to you, Norma. We can certainly, you know, I can, we can share the academic side of it, but to be able to hear from your side of it would be great. Yep, thank you for reminding us. Uh, so uh, folks, uh, welcome to our um, screen here, Dr. Ming and uh, Associate Dean Susan Stone. Hi, yes, thank you. That does sound like uh, a question for a district. Given that the, the question starts with how might a school district, and to be honest, I had to read it twice to pick up on that myself. So for me, it always starts from the why. And some of that is embedded in here, but just to make it a little bit more general. For a district, or actually anybody who's considering partner with, partnering with researchers, the first question is why partner with researchers? Why do you want research to be involved? And what do you intend to get out of it? And so from the district perspective, the way that I always counsel my colleagues or somebody else in the district is to think through what is the action that you might take given the knowledge that you have now and what other action are you considering? And then where does research come in to inform you so that you can distinguish between those potential actions? Because districts frankly do not have the time to just engage in knowledge for its own sake we necessarily have to focus on how do we best serve our students most effectively and equitably. And so with that question in mind, then think, all right, what kind of research would help me answer this? At this point, in order to try to engage in that conversation, I do think that it is valuable to have a research office, and I know that not all districts have that, but with a research office that has some understanding of how to start to formulate potential research questions and how to connect to potential researchers who might be equipped to address those questions. This is actually a really complicated question and I appreciate that many people are wondering this, but that's at minimum where I would start. I'll let professors Ozer and Stone speak a little bit more to what that process has been like from their perspective. Susan, why don't you go and then I'll add on. Um, I think that um, as a um, long-term academic district partner, um, one of um, the habits of mind I had to cultivate and learn is, um, is really also letting the district's agenda um, set the tone versus my agenda. So I think over the years, I've had an investigator-driven sensibility that um, um, I, the partnership has helped me smooth um, to um, what I actually value even more as jointly developed and truly reciprocal work where I am also a learner in the process. Thanks, I'll just add on to say that um, realizing that we have the privilege of being more senior and further along. And so it, it, it has, the timing has been really perfect to be able to um, actually through our research practice partnership with, with Susan and myself as more senior members to also bring in more junior members who, who you know, don't have as much of a sense of comfort of being able to be as flexible with their research program, but to be able to, um, kind of bring them in and, and be able to support that work because I think it takes a lot of time to develop partnerships. And um, I mean, it's something that I think many of us have did even as an assistant professor or as graduate students, but it certainly does, um, it is very time intensive. I think that, um, I think a critical piece as uh, Norma, as, as you alluded to is I think your district, you all have such a clear sense of what you wanted from us. And you also have an existing partnership with Stanford and obviously a very sophisticated research office. I think there are other districts I know who 
have very little experience in working with academics based on where they're located. They're not bombarded with the same kind of requests that San Francisco Unified or others might be. And I think that uh, what's been really important, I think regardless of the district, is to be as clear as possible with um, what people's goals are to set up a memorandum of understanding, to have that be iterative. To so I, and, and we're actually right now working um, um, on a project to share out our process about developing a memorandum of understanding. So, and I'm happy to talk more with, with others if they want to reach out to us directly and learn more about how we went about doing it. And, you know, there's a large literature on really thinking about power and partnership and privilege and how you authentically work across these different um, systems. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This next question from an attendee uh, may be directed to Dr. Ruffalo. Uh, I'm curious if this bias among children of color was stronger toward males. Yeah, in my work, certainly it's gendered. I think that um, you know the, the the focus of you know the project I just finished wasn't gender per se as much as it was race, race and class structures. Um, but, you know, I think other scholars have already done a lot of really important work showing how gender, race, and class intersect in ways that shape whether teachers respond to the knowledge that they bring to school. Um, and certainly, um, some of the stereotypes that these white teachers shared um, were definitely more punitive and risk-laden for uh, young Asian American and Latinx men um, rather than women. It doesn't mean that they dismissed the digital skills that um, their kind of female counterparts had, but um, it did mean that, you know, at one of the schools I studied that det detentions were more willingly handed out for young Asian American men, for example. So definitely an undercurrent. And um, uh, I know there's a lot of people kind of looking into this as well now too. Thank you. Now, these next set of two questions uh, could be bundled. It comes from David Joseph Gottnier. Um, this may be directed at Dean Carter's presentation. Uh, where do concepts like, quote unquote, the achievement gap or, quote unquote, the learning loss, where do these come from? What are some good alternative uh, phrases or discourses that uh, are consequential for framing quote unquote, student outcomes? Are there already models of school engagements that are closing racial and economic disparities, such as Canada's work in Harlem uh, zone, um, though these admittedly rely on uh, heavily on physical locations? Uh, what are the alternatives? Uh, Dean Carter, I'm, that might be for you. Right, so um, I think when you think about the concepts and, and their gravity, they go back a long way. We're, who coined the terms, I couldn't say. I mean, but I certainly when you start to think about um, when we start comparing socioeconomic and racial groups in American society, we can go back to the Coleman, back to 1966 to the Coleman Report. Um, we could probably go back even farther, uh, whether or not someone was saying specifically achievement gap to the uh, research that was a marshal to um, fight the Brown versus Board of Education um, cases. So the Supreme Court cases, we've been talking about the differences contrasting for social justice purposes for a long time. Um, but the um, the notion of the achievement gap as it is, it's kind of a picked up steam over the decades and certainly over the latter part of the 20th century. Um, uh, and, and particularly as we started to go to NAEP testing, um, disaggregating, I think one could arguably uh, make the point or the case that it was heightened when we had no child left behind implemented and there was a disaggregation of data by race and class. And there's so, so heightened tension and, 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 and angst about that because um, the data were showing it so clearly by those subgroups. Um, in terms of learning loss, I mean, I just saw that all it takes is for one, for social media to pick up a kernel of an idea and a reporter to write about it, and then it can get propagated. Who, who coined it again? I don't know, but it is something that is popular and the journalists have certainly uh, promoted it over time. I think the bigger question the larger question for me is, well, how do we talk about this in this moment? And in fact, I saw something just on um, social media. I spent a lot of time on Twitter today where an educator made the argument 
why isn't that we're not valorizing and talk about what strengths our children picked up under these extraordinary times, right? What an extraordinary moment. Many of us talk about adults, our COVID hobbies and the new skills we've done. We have not been talking about children in the same way. And we know that they've had to be resilient to live under these conditions for the last year, just like we've had to be resilient. And I can tell you just anecdotally, all the things that I see my child haven't been able to do uh, and develop as an only child in a household, isolated from other children, socially, uh, emotionally, even though it may be that his math skills are not as strong as one would arguably think that a first grader should be at this point. So I use the term knowledge acquisition, knowledge diversity. I want to use the things that are asset-based and affirming of children under these extraordinary conditions, not deficit-based. And I, but I believe the deficit base is so strongly linked, let's be real here, to the power of the testing industry. Um, the testing industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and test makers want those tests to be used. And they are, the more we utilize them, the more they can find this evidence or say, you know, so um, that there are differences among groups and that they can produce, uh, uh, prove the reliability and validity of these tests, uh, the more we rely on them, right? Um, and, but here's the biggest problem. All of the data show that these are just class markers. They're so hugely class markers. And so what we're trying to do, this is an analogy I use in my writing is that we have kids who are born with access to elevators going at the rates, the speed of bullet speed, uh, bullet uh, trains, bullet, uh, at the speed of bullet trains, we have kids on escalators going up and up. And then we have kids on, on stairwells with missing handrails and broken steps. And we say, get to floor 12 at the same time. And if you don't, you got to, uh, the, the rate of speed by group, if they don't, we call it an achievement gap, when fundamentally it has to do with the, the, the material context of children's lives. And we're not talking about that. So in my writing, I have written about opportunity gaps, of, of the, the disparities and opportunities to learn. That's how you frame it, not the symptoms, but what's the causes. And I, so by talking about learning loss, you're really talking about a symptom of major conditions in our society, uh, as opposed to talking about what was created. But more importantly, what's healthy for our children in terms of their own self-esteem over the long term, if we keep talking about them in these deficit-oriented ways. In terms of Canada, just quickly, it goes back to that analogy too. We did see some positive benefits, although there are some economists who've also critiqued the the children's zone. It takes a lot of money. If you look at how much that Harlem Children's Zone project actually costs per capita to produce those overwhelming results, they're essentially creating opportunities like wealthy children would. And so if you, if you, if our nation is willing to invest those kinds of resources that are equivalent to what families what tutors, what fancy summer camps and all those things can do to create the richness in the, the, and, and to support children's learning and advancement for every child, then we can get to equity. But we're not gonna do that if we don't have that investment at a national level. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Carter. Um, I, let's stay a little bit on this train of thought um, and, and broaden it to the panel because Jules Winters, um, is really um, interested in the, the seductiveness of a deficit perspective, even in well-intended classrooms and, and instructors. And, um, you know, that the often it is a very individualist um, orientation rather than, as opposed to, we have a couple sociologists in the room, as opposed to a study, study of structures, for example. So, you know, um, what, what is the seductiveness of, of the deficit perspective that is, is simultaneously so individualist? Is that for me? I don't want to take up more space. Yeah, it uh, says here that it, it's, it was for you, but it says, and others. So uh, other people on the panel. If, if you know, if I, I and let me just get rid of bracket up here, because I think we can afford to do that as academics. And it's important to think about also for me, I, I, it begs the question of whether or not these ne deficit narratives are also kind of the neo-eugenesis narratives in some ways when you bring in the racially minoritized history. Let's be real that these are not divorced from larger systems of, of, of racism, white supremacy, anti-Blackness. I mean, when you think about it, there is something about these narratives that can are used to justify and legitimize the 
distribution of resources in our society, who gets access to what. And, um, and if you can rely on these, new, these kind of narrow uh, uh, metrics, um, you, you utilize and we use them to justify whether or not kids are going to get into UC Berkeley, right? We use them to justify, but what's, re what's really interesting is that we are in a pivotal moment right now, just today in the New York Times, um, a group of lawyers have filed a lawsuit suing uh, New York City public schools about how they propagate segregation through testing and admissions in the high status schools. And so we're going to see more and more pushback because we actually know that these things are intrinsically unequal, um, that the metrics that we use are highly associated and correlated with actually privilege, class privilege in our society. So it, it is a moment, we are in a moment of reckoning right now about these things and the courts are ruling in some favor of the plaintiff classes in these cases. Thank you. If I, if I can jump in on that, um, I really appreciate the question. And um, I'm also, I identify as a community psychologist. And so this is very much framed in a community psychology way, this question um, about taking it beyond the individual. I, I think um, to build on what Dean Carter was saying, I think also what we struggle with here at UC Berkeley is an academic culture that, um, has traditionally, I mean, it varies across department and, and a unit, but I think this sense of um, that more flexibility and a sort of more humanity might or uh, uh, would 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 be undermining the academic standards. And so I think that's another aspect of it is sort of um, you know we we have a, a certain um, culture around, um, you know, a kind of sink or swim elbows out culture as, as the chancellor likes to say. And I think that, um, I think during the pandemic and I'm on this divisional council where we were trying to address this, there was more flexibility given around pass, no pass, around grading, right? We were explicitly told to, to, to um, sort of be more compassionate and flexible. And I think that it is an opportunity like when we're talking about K-12 education to reframe, um, what academic excellence looks like and to um, enable more flexible ways of learning and to not equate that with lower standards because I mean a time a time test a time test is not a good ecological indicator of who's good at a lot of different things um, and and so I do think um, you know I've been pushing for that others have been pushing for that um, and um, and I, I think there are some opportunities um, to think about that. And I think what we have now is we have that rigidity and then we have folks with accommodations, right? For the, through the DSP office, as opposed to, which is individual level on, in a sense, as opposed to thinking like the, like, um, the question was framed, how do we come up with a structure where people can learn in different ways and all get to the learning objectives we wanna see? And I'll just, briefly weigh in, I think, I think, you know, like something, you know, we have actually a lot of models for even with digital tech, like how to make online learning really fun and helpful for, you know, whomever. But I think like missing in there is that even if you have a pedagogical approach that you think will help bring value to students is that there are all of these structures at play that make it hard for teachers to achieve them. Um, and one thing, one big piece of this, which I expect is very closely tied to deficit model thinking, is that, you know, as teachers, we use it as an excuse to not look at how we are perpetuators of white ideology. You know, we're putting the burden on kids' success when instead we should be focusing on the structures that we participate in that contribute to these things. And so that's just another kind of little note on that, that I wanted to call out whether it's online or not learning, you know. Well, uh, Professor Foucault um, asks, uh, you know, a question that extends this. So that it's not just, she, she, she would like the panel to address the, the fact that it's not just the learning process that's changing, but the entire, institutional ecology upon which education as a public good depends. So I, I wonder if, if the panelists could address the, the idea of a social ecology that's changing um, in addition to the learning process. 
I think that's an excellent question. Um, and it's a, an excellent point. I think though the data that I, I showed earlier exposes to extent to which education is full, so often subscribed to as a private good, but the pandemic, and this is what Roy I think is trying to get us to get to is that post pandemic, we should be increasingly moving as a society to the idea of education as a public good. Um, and, and part of that means the superstructure has to change. The norms, the ideology about the fundamental purposes of education, um, the practices of education would have to change as well. And so does that mean, because the, the way that we test and standardize knowledge is very much congruent with education as a private good. And it, it's consumable, it, 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 it engenders and enhances competition, and it, it, it lends itself to the framing that we are better than, we are more meritorious, we should be rewarded than those because the standard, the mean, the significant differences in the mean scores on these different outcomes that we use. But if we start to think about education more as a public good, and certainly something that in my, and I argue this in my work, that is more healthy for the democracy, that it's more is going to lead us to a more deeply inclusive and social justice oriented society, then we have to think about how to get rid of those methods, those tools, those practices that propagate and reinforce segregation, that reinforce class privilege, that reinforce the patterns that, that become so normal for us so that we use code words like urban for racially minoritized and poor and suburban for affluent and white. And, 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 and then when we talk about achievement gaps, we know who we're talking about at the bottom. So how do we get away from those? Um, and so I, I do think that is begging for institutional change in the ecology, whether or not we are at the individual level because so many of us have pardon the proverbial expression, drunk in the Kool-Aid. We subscribe to the achievement ideology that's dominant today. And I don't know how you break that, that will take a, a cultural and a narrative change. Thank and you. I just want to add too, like related to that, um, part of the question was actually about the involvement of ed tech companies. Ed tech companies have been involved in this for a very long time, like back to even Apple in their first computers. And so, um, you know, I think the, the role of the, these companies and their work in schools has very much been in lockstep in amplifying those very meritocratic structures. Um, that we talk about. Well, I we might have time for a question from me. <laughs> and uh, the, we've been hearing about um, this word normal and that people are waiting to get back to normal, right? But it's, and, and it may implicate other phrases and terms such as um, what's come up uh, in, in, in Dean Carter's uh, learning loss uh, example, for example. Um, so are we waiting for normal? Because before the pandemic, it didn't look so good for some students and for some communities. So do we want normal? Do we wanna use that well-worn phrase, new normal? Or what do we say about normal? This for the entire panel. <laughs> If you don't mind, I wanted to hop on something that the that the dean started with the narrative, and I think it relates to your conceptions of the new normal and takes it back to the Roy quote of what might we let go of as and I've been thinking a lot of um, knowing that the fraughtness of letting go is 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 structured. Um, but one of the um, one of the things that that I have thought that is part of this structure is that the American public also I think puts a great deal of expectations on education as an institution that it is not equipped to do. Education can't um, can't 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 make a broken health system better. Um, education can't uh, be a substitute for um, a fragmented, specialty mental health safety net. 
Um, and so as I was thinking about um, what the new normal is in the behaviors, I might, um, I might drop the narrative of the institution as everything. Um, even though there's lots of investments that education is the full panacea. Thank you, Professor Stone. I wonder if I might jump in to pose a question since I know we've got sociologists and psychologists involved. I'm thinking about the deficit framing and the asset framing. And so I can't give the actual citation, but I know that there's some research showing that people are more generous when they understand that the people to whom they are giving, whatever it might be, are worse off. And so that unfortunately is an incentive to reinforce the deficit framing. And then it has me wondering, at the same time that that's true, we've just gone through a year where people have not been paying attention to all of the gaps and all of the ways in which our youth are suffering. And so I was thinking how that is an indication of how our youth are relatively um, undervalued and disempowered because they are the ones who are going to be disproportionately bearing the brunt of this pandemic for years and decades to come. And so for some reason, we don't have enough attention to that. People are not thinking ahead and being generous toward the youth, even though historically people are more generous to the people that they perceive as being less well off. And so I'm wondering how we couple that with some of what people have said about the asset framing or uplifting the voice of the youth when they do have a lot of powerful insights and ideas. What are the ways in which we might work with that potential contradiction from a psychological perspective, a sociological perspective to reconcile that so that people are thinking in a more communal, a communal way about where we have opportunities to work together to move forward? Wonderful question to end on. Mm. Well, I have so many thoughts and I just want to figure out how do I, I, I combine the two of these to think about this moment post pandemic. And um, there are two things. I, I think the pandemic is forcing us to radically disrupt our own understanding of what the goal post or the end point is, right? That it's actually dynamic that it should not be set or fixed. It should not be predicated on the prior generation, that this generation that we are part of it are all been, a, 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 you know, basically challenged by a major uh, event in human history. And why not take a more humanistic approach, as you say, Norma, um, by thinking about our youth in just a much more uh, humane way. So for me, I would, would hope that we could get away from this consumerist, economistic, because the economists and the policymakers are driving it. What's the impact on the productivity of our economy in the long term? That's a really problematic thing to think about. It first narrows the function and purpose of education. If we think more humanistically, then we could think about what is it that, what are the human strengths that are cultivated? And what are our children going to be able to teach the next generation about hardship under the face of living through climate change and viruses and so forth. What came out of this, if we ask them, I do hope educators will spend a lot of time really learning about what children have learned. That's not having to do with the three R's. That's the first thing. The second thing to go to uh, Professor Stone's point for me about what education as a fundamental institution can't do. When I look around the globe at our, our other democratic nations and industrial nations, the one difference, a major difference, is that those countries already had massive safety nets in place for their people. Um, when I look to our neighbors to the north, I look to the Western European countries, of course, we're so big and we're so different. But I believe that we put so much onus on education because it's the one major social institution where we actually all come together and it is government supported and it's supposed to be of us and by us and for us. And honestly, I think it begs the question if we need to get back to centralized education where there's federal government protections because education in and of itself is one of the main conduits to having access to the things that we need to, to survive in our society. And if we don't, if we don't put that, if we, if we don't make that institution uh, and just say, it's just about learning, it's just about so, certain knowledge inquisition and the process, then I think we're actually gonna set ourselves back from closing the historical um, 
gaps that we've had that have been attributable to the way the society has been formed. So that social institution, we can build another one, but I guess the question is, what is it? And maybe it is that social policy just becomes much better so that this $1.9 trillion becomes the beginning of something that the government is going to do over time to become more socially, um, um, to become more economically inclusive, so to speak, so that schools don't have to do it. You're right. So, um, but I think so e economics and housing and ed education would have to work together as social policies. Yeah. Thank you. I think that may bring us to the end of this wonderful panel. And uh, thank you again for reminding us the imprudence that uh, we hope this crisis will not be wasted uh, upon us. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'd like to just thank the audience for coming, for participating, for asking the excellent questions for uh, director of the social science matrix, Professor Marion Fourcade and her staff and her, her team, uh, Chuck, Jessica, others who made this happen. And finally, for the panelists, Dr. Prudence, uh, Dean Prudence Carter, uh, Professor Emily Ozer and her team, no Dr. Norma Ming and Associate Dean Susan Stone. Um, and finally, uh, Dr. Matthew Ruffalo, thank you. I, I've really enjoyed this. I've really gotten a lot of this, uh, a lot out of this. Uh, again, Thanks for everyone um, for coming. Uh, please you. attend future Matrix Zooms and uh, meetings. Thank you Thank all. Thank you. Thank you.